Hi everybody, welcome to my YouTube channel Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my every page Dr. Srinivas Concepts. This is Dr. Srinivas, Neurologist from Rajmandri, Andhra Pradesh, India. I am also the medical author of the book Focused Neurology. Today we are going to talk about a very very interesting topic, the clinical examination of the fifth cranial nerve the clinical examination of the fifth cranial nerve cranial nerves part 44 trigeminal nerve part 2 so we are going to talk about the clinical examination of the fifth cranial nerve the fifth cranial nerve first we will talk about the examination of the motor functions assessment of the trigeminal motor function is accomplished by examining the muscles of mastication. Unilateral trigeminal motor weakness causes deviation of the jaw towards the weak side on opening because of the unopposed action of the contralateral pterygoid. So very very important. Fifth nerve lateral pterygoid pushes the jaw to the opposite side. So, when the fifth nerve gets affected, the jaw will move towards the diseased side. The tongue also deviates towards the side of the weakness with the twelfth nerve lesion. So, both the tongue and the jaw deviate towards the weakness. Easy to remember is to remember it with the rule of 17. Twelfth nerve and fifth nerve will push the parts to the opposite side. So, when twelfth nerve or fifth nerve gets affected, the corresponding parts will move towards the diseased side or the same side 12 plus 5 is 17 whereas if 10th nerve or 7th nerve are affected the movement will be towards the healthier side so 10 plus 7 is also 17 12 plus 5 is also 17 so if 12th nerve and 5th nerve gets affected the movement will be towards the diseased side or the same side whereas if 10th nerve and 7th nerve gets affected the movement will be to the opposite side or the healthier side so easy to remember is to remember with the e, with the rule of 17. That was about the examination of the motor functions. Now let's talk about the examination of the sensory functions. Sensation should be compared and in each trigeminal division, namely the ophthalmic division, maxillary division, and mandibular division, and the perioral region compared to the posterior face to exclude the onion skin pattern or the balaclava helmet distribution. Pain or temperature should be compared with a touch to exclude dissociated sensory loss, a common finding in lateral medullary syndrome. There are three common exercises in evaluating facial sensation, determining whether the sensory loss is organic or non-organic, determining which modalities are involved and defining the distribution. Now let's talk about the examination of the reflexes, the jaw reflex. To elicit the jaw reflex, the examiner places an index finger or the thumb or the middle of the patient's chin holding the mouth open about midway with the jaw relaxed then taps the finger with the reflex knee hammer. The response is an upward jerk of the mandible. The afferent impulses of this reflex are carried through the sensory portion of the trigeminal nerve to the mesencephalic nucleus with the efferent impulses through its motor portion. So the afferent of the jaw jerk is also fifth nerve. The efferent of the jaw jerk is also fifth nerve. The afferent is carried through the trigeminal nerve to the mesencephalic nucleus with the efferent impulses to the motor portion. In normal individuals, the jaw jerk is minimally active or absent. The jaw jerk is exaggerated with lesions affecting the corticobulbar pathways above the motor nucleus, especially if it is bilateral as in pseudobulbar palsy or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. This jaw jerk is, this jaw reflex is extremely important in differentiating between the pseudobulbar palsy and bulbar palsy. In bulbar palsy, since the cranial motor 
nuclei per se are affected, the jaw jerk is absent. Whereas if it is pseudobulbar palsy, it is an upper motor neuron type of lesion. So when the lesion, the pons, the fifth nerve nucleus is in the pons. So if the, both the corticobulbar fibers supplying the fifth nerve nucleus are affected, what we call it as a pseudobulbar palsy, then the jaw jerk becomes exaggerated. So one of the important methods to differentiate between the bulbar palsy and pseudobulbar palsy is jaw reflex. The jaw jerk is absent in bulbar palsy, whereas it is exaggerated in pseudobulbar palsy. Because the bulbar palsy findings and pseudobulbar palsy findings are almost similar. That's why the name pseudo. So one important way to differentiate pseudobulbar palsy from bulbar palsy is the jaw reflex. So the jaw jerk is exaggerated with the lesions affecting the corticobulbar pathways above the motor nucleus especially if it is bilateral as in pseudobulbar palsy or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Corneal reflex. The corneal reflex is elicited by lightly touching the cornea with a wisp of cotton it is used to assess the first division of the fifth cranial nerve that is the ophthalmic division of the fifth cranial nerve that is the afferent in response to the corneal stimulation there would be blinking of the ipsilateral direct reflex and the contralateral consensual reflex eyes the afferent limb of the reflex is mediated by the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve and the efferent is the bilateral seventh nerve supplying the orbicularis oculi the blink reflex is an electrophysiologic test in which an electrical stimulus is delivered to the trigeminal nerve and a response is recorded from the facial muscles. So this is the blink reflex. The patterns of the direct and consensual corneal reflex abnormality with trigeminal and facial nerve lesions. So you have a complete trigeminal nerve lesion and a complete facial nerve lesion on the left side. Then we see the response of the direct corneal reflex and the consensual corneal reflex. So when there is a complete trigeminal nerve lesion, the stimulus involved eye, the direct corneal reflex is absent and the consensual corneal reflex is also absent. Whereas if the stimulus is on the opposite eye, the direct consensual reflex is normal and the consensual corneal reflex is also normal. Now what happens if there is a complete facial nerve lesion? Stimulus involved eye, the direct corneal reflex is absent whereas the con consensual corneal reflex is normal. In a complete facial nerve lesion, if there is a stimulation given in the opposite eye, the direct corneal reflex is normal whereas the consensual corneal reflex is absent. So this is the brink reflex, the afferent is the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve and efferent is the bilateral facial nerves supplying orbicularis oculi. Disorders of the trigeminal nerve. Motor dysfunction. Patients with myasthenia gravis may have chewing difficulties with masticatory fatigue, especially when eating difficult to chew things such as meat. So myasthenia gravis patients, initially they may chew the eat, chew the meat well. But after some time, because of easy fatigability, they will have difficulty in chewing the meat. Pathology involving the trigeminal nerve and its connections may result in misdirection of nerve fibers producing unusual effects. The Marcus gun phenomenon, the jaw winking phenomenon, opening of the mouth causes reflex elevation of the eyelid. The reverse Marcus gun phenomenon or otherwise known as Marin Amatsine. Involuntary closure of one eye on mouth opening is a synkinesia between aberrant regeneration of the facial nerve, usually following Bell's palsy. Now let's talk about the sensory dysfunction. The most common disorder to involve the trigeminal sensory nerve is trigeminal neuralgia. Stimulus evoked pain is one of the most striking features of the trigeminal neuralgia and has high diagnostic value. Absence of a sensory deficit is one criterion for the diagnosis of classical trigeminal neuralgia. 
So there is stimulus evoked pain. Breeze can cause pain. Just touching with a blade. When male patients they try to shave, that can also cause severe pain. Stimulus evoked pain is one of the most striking features of trigeminal neuralgia and has high diagnostic value. But in classical trigeminal neuralgia, there is absence of a sensory deficit. So absence of sensory deficit is one criteria for the diagnosis of classical trigeminal neuralgia. The most common cause of trigeminal neuralgia is a compression of the sensory root by an ectactic arterial loop of the basilar artery, usually ICA, anterior inferior cerebellar artery. Rarely structural lesions may also cause facial pain referred to as symptomatic or secondary trigeminal neuralgia. These lesions cause sensory loss in the involved distribution, motor dysfunction, example multiple sclerosis. So in the symptomatic trigeminal neuralgia or secondary trigeminal neuralgia, there is sensory loss in the involved distribution. Trigeminal neuralgia usually involves the second or third division, whereas post-herpetic neuralgia usually involves the first division. So trigeminal neuralgia usually involves the maxillary or mandibular division, whereas post-herpetic neuralgia involves the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. Migraine may be a neurovascular syndrome related to abnormalities in the trigeminovascular system with serotonin playing an important role. So these are the important concepts when we examine trigeminal nerve in a patient. The other important concepts of neurology, I have put it in a question and answer format in a book, Focused Neurology, uh, written by me, Dr. S. Srinivas. This book is available all over the world and can be purchased online from all leading booksellers, including Amazon. So if interested, this book could be bought online, which will be very useful, especially for students, especially for oral exams. I hope you have enjoyed listening to my concepts on clinical examination of the trigeminal now if you have enjoyed it please like it share it but please subscribe my youtube channel dr sinuas medical concepts and my b page dr sinuas concepts thank you bye